Hey, thanks for joining us today. My name's Drew Ketchum. I'm the campus pastor down at the Green Campus. And today I'm gonna be finishing up our series, Honed, where we're looking at the spiritual disciplines. Uh, about three weeks ago, Pastor Jason came up and he spoke on the discipline of silence and solitude. And I gotta say, it was one of my absolute favorite messages because I am a big time introvert, right? I can be alone for massive amounts of time and be perfectly happy, uh, social, interactions drain me. I love people. I love talking to people, but I feel drained afterwards. And so I got home from that message and I got, went to my wife and said, you know, love, uh, I just want you to hear, uh, Pastor Jason said, it's great that I want to be, uh, have peace and quiet in the house. In fact, it's because I just want to be holy and like Jesus. And if you're not catching it, that was very tongue in cheek. And my wife, you know, she's, she's great. She fired back. That's great, Drew. You can have some peace and quiet. That'll be fine. We'll help you out there. But Remember, in about three weeks, you get to speak on the discipline of community, and that's my jam. Uh, So that is what I'm going to be speaking on today, is the discipline of community. And it's one that we don't often think of as a spiritual discipline. It's not often uh, included in the list, but we felt it was really important uh, because all the other disciplines were about deepening uh, relationship with God, and this discipline is about deepening a relationship with God's people. So, um, I gotta say, it was a really hard topic to study and now be up here speaking about, because I grew up kind of learning that community was an outdated idea a little bit, right? Uh, I am an American, and I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and the culture, the media, all of it uh, said that you should be the lone wolf right? Like uh, community was just to drag you down. You got to be the do-it-yourself, take no prisoner kind of guy. And uh, and I grew up around watching shows. I watched, you know, Bruce Willis defeat an entire tower of terrorists single-handedly. And in sports, I was a big sports follower. I watched Michael Jordan uh, win championship after championship. And like the mantra that I heard was just give Jordan the ball and get out of his way, right? Everybody else existed just to get in these guys' way. And of course, it was a lie. They desperately needed community, all right? Uh, Bruce Willis, he's a, he played fictional characters. The idea that he didn't need anybody and the things that he did it was cool, but it's equally absurd, right? It was impossible. That's why it's fiction. And Michael Jordan, yeah, he was the greatest basketball player of all time, but he also had a Hall of Famer next to him, one of the best defensive players and rebounders, and a great supporting cast outside of that, all right? Nobody, except in small, very specific sections of time, all right, accomplish the things they set out to by themselves. We need community. And so uh, maybe you're listening to me and saying, Drew, that's great, I, but I don't really need community. I'm better than that. I can still be the lone wolf. And I want to say that if you are denying community, you are denying a part of who you are. That community is innate. And by that, I mean that we were made to be in community Uh, It is a part of how God created us. And I want to go back and take a look uh, from the very beginning how this is evident. In the creation story, right, it starts out and it goes through this pattern. It says, God said, let there be, and he creates light in the earth and the land and all the animals within. It's a great story. And after everyone, he says, this is good. And then we get to verse 26. It's the final part of creation before he rests. And God changes how he talks. God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And it's a really weird uh, sentence, right? Because it's, God says, let us. And if you caught it, God switches to the plural. Often it's God is referred to as he. But in this, when he's talking about himself, he talks of himself in the plural, And that's because it reveals the nature of who God is. Our God, our creator, is a triune God. That means he is three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are all God. They're not each other. We could spend an entire day going through this theology of how God exists in the Trinity. But it's an amazing thing because God has existed for all time, past, present, and future, 
in perfect relationship with himself. Right? God has existed in perfect relationship with himself. It's a crazy idea to comprehend and think about. Right? <clears throat> but that is who he is. And this is important to understand because when it goes forward, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, it describes how God makes us. See, when he makes us in, our, in his image, in his likeness, it doesn't mean that he makes us to look like him. Instead, what it means is he imparts in us aspects of who he is, right? That includes intelligence, creativity, morals, emotion, empathy, on and on. But one of the things that it means is that when God created us, he created us with a desire to be in community. The creation story goes on, of course, in Adam. He creates Adam, right? And God notices a problem. There's Adam, God, they're walking together on earth in perfect relationship. Adam is in perfect relationship with God, the most perfect with the exclusion of Jesus. And God notices something. There's a problem. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Yes, he has the most important relationship. He needs God. But God notices that there's, a, there's something missing for Adam. And so he brings forth the animals and says, you can name them and you'll have dominion over them. But there's no helper, suitable helper to be found. Animals are great. And we always think of a dog as man's best friend. And dogs are awesome. I'm, I have two dogs and I love them greatly. They're my friends in a sense, right? But they're not feeling the aspect of community I need. And God sees this. And so what he does is he puts Adam to sleep and he takes a rib from his side and he creates Eve. He finally creates a, a helper suitable for him. And it's, it exists only in other parts of humanity, right? That what Adam needed, what we need, is to be in relationship, yes, with God, but in relationship with our own kind. We were created with community in mind. It is innate in who we are. I love uh, kind of looking at how the Bible matches up with science and psychology. And over the past several decades, they've been looking at how important community is for us. And they've, psychologists and Christian psychologists as well, have come up with this term called chronic loneliness or isolation. And it's this idea that people are in, we as Americans and in Western culture, we are in great danger because of chronic loneliness. And when I say that, not just like, oh, I feel lonely today, I didn't see my friends. No, day after day after day, we are separated from people who we are supposed to be in connection with. And it is crushing us. That chronic loneliness impacts somewhere between 36 to 60% of Americans. That means if you're at home, half your family, or if you're here today listening at the church, if you look around, half of everyone you see is lonely, like deeply lonely where it affects their soul and their heart and their mind. And it is devastating to us, right? Just a real quick rundown. If you experience chronic loneliness, you are 29% more likely to have chronic heart disease, 32% more likely to have a stroke, twice as likely to develop dementia. You'll have an increase in inflammation, depression, sleep disorder, type 2 diabetes, substance abuse, excess weight gain, problems concentrating, and the list goes on and on. When we are outside of community with our own kind, with other humans, we fall apart. And what I love is, we didn't need all these studies. We just had to trust God. From the very beginning, he said, this is not good. Humans need to be in relationship with other humans. And I want to, before I move on, clarify what I mean by community. Because there's a lot of ways in which we can have community. You could say you have community with, if you're on a sports team, you could have community the people you work with could be a community. And these are all good things, and they can be an aspect. But when I'm talking about community, what I mean is authentic, transparent group of Christ followers living together on mission. I'm going to say that again. That community is an authentic, transparent group of Christ followers living together on mission. 
It's not just hanging out with the people who, who share your hobbies. It is an intimate relationship in which Christ is the focus of it, this group. So why? Why beyond is it's just what we need, right? Like it's that part of us, but what is the benefit of community? And what I've found is that community encourages growth. Community is the primary environment for discipleship. I have never in my life or heard a story in my life about a mature Christ follower who didn't become that way without other mature followers or growing followers pouring into them. They didn't, nobody just arrived at it. Yes, the, the, the disciplines that you practice by yourself were an aspect of it, but they needed other people. I'll go a step further. That I don't know a single Christ follower who came to know God, to came to be in relationship with their creator and their savior outside of relationship or at least hearing from another person. That discipleship and community are intertwined. And to be outside of the community means that you are outside of discipleship. There's a couple passages I wanted to take a look at about how uh, community helps us to grow, encourages us to grow. The first one I want to look at was Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That the writer was encouraging these people that they needed to be in community, to not give up on community, because one of the things that community was doing was encouraging each other to live out the mission of God. They were spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. They were living out the great commission in their community by how they acted towards other people and how they treated other people. And if you've ever set out to do anything, it's really hard to do so without encouragement. We have a great ability as humans to get down on ourselves, to look at things from a negative angle. But when we are together on mission together, it gives us an ability to support one another and say, we need to move forward in this. When things are hard, we need to move forward in this. When you're doing things well, great job, let's continue to move forward. And that's what the writer was saying, that you need to continue to meet together not the only reason, but for one of the reasons, so that you can be on mission and encourage each other to live out the calling of Christ in your life, individually and as a community. The other one I wanted to take a look at is Philippians 1, 27 through 28. It says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Here's Paul writing in the church at Philippi, encouraging them that they need to be together in community. They need to be united by the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to withstand the persecution that they were experiencing. And I would say that this for us today, we need each other to withstand persecution. And I want to be very clear. The persecution that they were experiencing and others have experienced throughout history is not the same that we're experiencing now. That our persecution looks different. For most of us as Americans, right, living in America, we are not under persecution, a threat of death or imprisonment. Yeah, maybe that will change down the line in the, in the far future. Who knows what ha what, what, what's out there for us. But right now, except for very small, isolated incidents, our persecution looks nothing like that. And one of the ways I think that we need to withstand persecution is to withstand the culture of the surrounding society. That the culture around us is constantly changing. It has been uh, long before I was ever born. And as it changes, it pressures us to continue to transform Form and adopt the principles of wherever it's going. 
And together, what we can do is we can stand firm in the convictions and the biblical morals that God has handed down to us. And these cover a wide variety of things. Yes, abortion. Yes, uh, issues relating to LGBTQ. But also, how do we treat widows and orphans? How do we handle racism? That God has specific ways and ideals that we are to adopt as followers of him. And it's really easy when we're by ourselves to conform to the pressures of society. One of the ones that I see often right now is this idea that if you disagree, that you hate. That we as Christians can't disagree with a lifestyle choice or we're hateful. And yes, some of that unfortunately has come from within that we have not spoken out in love but in hate. But some of that is a culture that wants us to change, that wants us to shame us, to abandon the principles of God and adopt the principles of an ever-changing society. And I gotta say, it is really hard to withstand the pressures of the outside world by yourself, that we need community And again, that's authentic, transparent group of Christ followers to stand up to the societal pressures around us. That we together are much better and stronger at standing firm to our convictions when when we're united. One thing I want to kind of challenge a bit before I move on is how we are engaging in community right now uh, in 2022. That one of the dangers I see, and this isn't my idea, this is, comes from a lot of people doing a lot of research, that we ha- have made a very devastating choice, that we have begun to replace community with connections. That we believe that we are in true community, when in fact we have no community, we just have connections. And this has come to its apex in the form of social media. It's how we live out, not just social media, but our whole lives. That we have these friends, you know, 50, 100, 1,000 friends who aren't really friends at all. They're a connection we made here or there, we stay in contact. And what we're doing in these connections is not knowing people, we're just knowing about them. Because social media and a lot of the way we communicate now, we're giving a curated version of who we are. When I was uh, just out of college, this was about 20, or excuse me, 2006, give or take a year. I had abandoned community. And this was of my own doing. This was my own fault as a result of bitterness and some hurts that I had. I had abandoned community and fully embraced the idea of connections. And it was, there was a lot of ways this played out, but one of them was over Facebook. It was the hot thing at the time. And if you were to go back and look at my Facebook from 2006, you could say you knew me, but the truth is you would only know about me. And there were two main things you could probably learn from my Facebook. The first is that I love the Seahawks. And the second, that I love nature. I love being out in nature. I love hiking and I love camping. And these are things that are or were true of me, but they miss so much about them. Because I had removed myself from community and replaced it with connections, people didn't know the full extent of my fandom and my enjoyment of nature. And I needed people to know the truth. See, the Seahawks, at that point in my life, they were an idol. I have no other way to say it. They were an idol. I had placed them as the most important thing in my life. In fact, there was about a 10-year period uh, that I never missed a single Seahawks game. And if you know football, right, football takes place on Sunday. And if you're following, that means I would skip church because I was not going to miss a Seahawks game. This was damaging not just to my personal growth in my relationship with God. This was damaging to my relationship with my wife because she desired to be at church growing in a Christ-following community. And instead I said, no, this will come in conflict with watching a game, right? That's what I was doing. Putting a child's game that men get paid astronomical amounts of money to do. I was putting that as the most important thing. And it wasn't just the Sunday game, right? It was invading my whole life. I would spend my days 
when I wasn't doing things, I would be reading about the Seahawks, following this blog and that blog and reading the stats. And I could tell you every single player on the team from that year and the years before and how they, what trades they were made and on and on. It was ridiculous. And in fact, the Seahawks game would set, would set the tone for the rest of my week. If the Seahawks had a great game, I was happy. I was ready to tackle the week. It was great. If the Seahawks had a bad game, if the, the refs did a terrible job, I'd be upset. And that would carry through my work week, my relationships. The Seahawks had complete control of how I was living. In fact, in that moment, I was not living in the fruit of the Spirit. I was living out the fruit of football. And I got to tell you, the fruit of football changes week to week (laughs) while the fruit of the Spirit remains constant. In nature, if you just knew what was seen from a connection, you would think, you wouldn't know, excuse me, you wouldn't know the actual relationship I have with nature. See, I have uh, incredibly bad allergies. Right? I still remember when I was in grade school, I went to get my tonsils removed and they finally wanted to do my allergy test. And so while I was out uh, <clears throat> unconscious or, you know, for my, my removal, they did the, the scratch test with all the different pollens in the Northwest. And when I woke up, I came to, both my arms were strapped down with leather restraints and my arm was covered in blood because I had scratched so hard from, from the test. And the doctor said, this is the worst allergies I've ever seen in my life. He had been an ENT specialist for decades. And I didn't need him to tell it. I knew because I would have to make a decision every time I went hiking or camping. Am I willing to spend the next several days feeling miserable? My eyes would swell almost to the point where they were shut and I couldn't see. That's how bad it would get. And you would miss all that because I had to remove myself from community and replaced it with connections. And here's the big thing. I needed people to know this and I needed people to speak into it. I needed discipleship that couldn't be had because I was no longer in community. Community is the primary environment for discipleship. You need community. We all need community. So, how do we create community? And I ask this question uh, from the most broadest sense of how, right? Not just how do we go about gathering or, or, or getting a community, but how does it look? What does community look like? And, and what are some things we need to know and be aware about when we go and create community? And to do this, I want to look at Acts 2, 42 through 47. But before I read through it, I want, to, I want to take a pause and make sure we approach it from the proper perspective. There's this idea uh, of hermeneutics, which is the study of how we study the Bible. And there's this, this tool we use called descriptive versus prescriptive. And before we look through it, we want to approach it from the proper perspective. Is this uh, prescriptive? Is what we read exactly what we have to do? Or is it descriptive? Does it describe what happens? And we need to take the principles, the timeless principles that are repeated throughout the Bible and apply them to our life. And this is really important. And I want to show you why really quick because through some uh, extreme examples, right? If we look at the story of Gideon from a prescriptive lens, meaning we have to do everything that it says, then we should be putting out our fleece. Anytime we have a question for God, we should be testing him. In the most ridiculous ways. But when read through a descriptive idea, this gives us a picture of how Gideon had some amount of faith but didn't fully trust. And God responded with grace and love despite Gideon's failure. And there's also multiple times in the Bible where people would respond to grief. They would mourn. They would put on sackcloth. And they would mourn. It would be an outward expression of what was going on inward. And if we look at it from a prescriptive lens that any time we're mourning, we need to get sackcloth. That's a burlap sack, cut holes in the sides and the head and put it on our bodies while we mourn for people to see. And this is actually a thing. If you go on Amazon 
right now and look at some of the burlap sacks, there are people leaving reviews about how this is a great tool for their mourning because they have approached it from a a prescriptive viewpoint versus a descriptive. And I say that because we're going to look through this part of Acts at the first biblical community, the early church. And it has great uh, value in how we can go about having community, but we need to take it in the proper context. So I'm going to read through and I'm going to stop when I see some points that are applicable to us in creating community. It's not the only thing, but some of the ones that I want to focus on. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. The first thing that stands out is they were devoted, right? This was intentional. The community that they had didn't just spring up and happen by accident. The things they were doing together, they devoted themselves to, they were purposeful about. If we want community, true, authentic (laughs) community, It's going to take us stepping out and searching for it and working to create it. In fact, I'm going to go a step further that some of us are going to have to sacrifice to have community. I told that story a little bit ago when I was in high college, right? And one of the reasons I didn't have community, I'm just going to be honest, was because of video games. I was placing entertainment and pleasure ahead of what I truly needed, which was community and discipleship. Some of us need to evaluate, yes, we're busy, but what are the things we're doing that are keeping us from community? And we might have to take a hard look and say, you know what, I have to get rid of some of this or tone back some of this, right? Entertainment in itself is not wrong, but it needs to be done in a proper time and amount. And things, some of this stuff needs to go away so we can engage in community. Going on, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I want to say here, like, this is not a call that we have to all live in a commune and give up everything we have for the community around us. But we need to focus on the heart of this. That community is focused not on self, but on the people around us. Where is our heart in our possessions? And if you want to know where your heart is, the best way you can do it is take a look at your time and your resources. Where are you investing and spending them? Is is it on consuming? Is it on doing things that that we enjoy? Are we using those things for the betterment of those around us? And going on, it says, everyone was filled, excuse me, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There's a thing that sticks out right at the beginning. Every day, that for the early church, community happened at all times. I know this is, this is going to be a challenge for some of us because this is, this is a huge challenge for me. I am apt to put my life into little boxes. Here's my work box. Here's my hobby box. Here's my family box. Here's my community box. And I'll pull out each one when I feel, yeah, it's the right time for each. And honestly, some, often my community box gets put on the back burner. I pull it out for an hour on Sunday morning and then maybe a life group when that's going on. And then I put it back on the shelf and return to the rest of my life. And this church, the early church, They didn't have a box. Community was all-encompassing. When they are at work, they were in authentic, transparent relationship with other Christ followers on mission. In all aspects of their life, where are you when you are at home? What What are you doing at home, right? They were eating together constantly. Is your home a retreat? Is it a monastery for you to refresh and go out to the world? Or has your home a missional outpost? Do we view this as time to be in community? And I say this, uh, <clears throat> I say this for myself as much as anybody. How am I using my home as a tool to build community, to invite people in to be in relationship and discipleship. And the last part I see in here 
as they added to their number daily who were being saved, all of this community served a purpose. It was to gather each other, to be a light in the darkness in their community. And it was so that everybody else could see how they were living differently. And it gathered people to Christ. They were on mission. Before I finish up, something I want to challenge is this idea of how community looks. Because I think what we often want is this perfect community, right? We want to be surrounded by these people of the same beliefs and politics, and they read the Bible the same, and they have the same hobbies. And yet community should not be like that. In fact, community should be messy. When we look at one of the most important communities, that is the community that Jesus created If you look at it, when it was actually formed, it is a mess. It had no business. These guys had no business being in community with each other. There was Simon who was a zealot. That is, he uh, was part of an organization looking to overthrow the Roman government. In fact, they were often assassins. They would, by force, including death, look to eliminate Roman officials and people, Jewish members of their community, who were supporting the Roman government. So here's Simon, and he joins this group that Jesus puts together, and it has Matthew, who's a tax collector. That is, he's a Jewish man who has become a turncoat and is now gathering taxes for the Roman Empire. You think it's difficult for a Democrats and Republicans to be together? These guys hated each other. You had a, a zealot who was looking to overthrow the government, and a guy who had turned away from his people to support this government. And yet they could come together under, under Jesus to grow and live on mission. And it didn't end there. Everything about them was crazy. They had a group, James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of thunder. And you don't get, excuse me, you don't get this name because you're meek and peaceful and agreeable. They were loud, obnoxious, <laughs> two guys that had to be so difficult to be around. And yet they all gathered together with Jesus to follow Jesus, to live transparently, to grow under him, and to live on mission. So how do you go about creating community? There's quite a few different ways. And before I finish up, I want to touch on these really quick. We at the church, we understand that community is really hard. So we provide quite a few resources. So if you're looking to step in the community, we have one-on-one opportunities, things like Flourish and, and some stuff for men that is being developed and already exists. There's uh, service. You can, the teams that serve within our church often develop a sense of community as they're on mission. There's life groups, there's prayer groups, there's care groups, there's mission groups that go outside the country. There are multiple opportunities for you to enter into groups. But also, outside of the church, I want to say if you're looking to com- create community, here's a couple things to do. One, just invite Somebody you know, whether it's at work or your neighborhood or maybe the person you sit next to while your kid's playing soccer, whatever it is, invite them to coffee, invite them to lunch. Invite them to come over to your house and have dinner, something. Just invite them in. Often they're just as lonely as you and feel just as awkward as you asking people to join you. Students, I know there's a lot of high schoolers listening. There are people at your school sitting at the lunch table who have nobody and desperately need you to come up and say, come join us. And the last thing I want to challenge is that idea of your home being a missional outpost. Over the past several decades, we've retreated deeper and deeper into our home. And you can't have community if you're not around anyone. Consider going outside, not just outside, but in your front yard. Imagine if we were returned to being out front during the day so people could see us or just going to parks or whatever it may be so that we can be around people. I want to leave you with this idea that community is about deepening relationships with others so that we may be matured in the likeness of Christ to better live out his mission on earth. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for listening. And I'm going to be releasing uh, to the campuses. Have a great day. Thanks for sticking around with us today. Uh, I do have some next steps for you. 
And what I would like you to do is take some time to evaluate where you can deepen relationships. Because all of these disciplines that we've spent this entire series uh, looking at, the main idea and focus of them is to deepen relationships with God and to deepen relationships with others, right? Prayer and, and reading your Bible is to hear from or to, to speak to God. Silence and solitude is to be in deep, intimate relationship with God. Community, to be in relationship with God's people with the idea of being able to grow together. And so what I'd like you to do is take some time not just looking at today's topic of community, but looking at all the different aspects, the different disciplines that we've spoken on for weeks. And which one can you invest time into growing? I know if you take them all as a whole, it's a lot of, it's a lot of things to do. It would be a drastic change to all of a sudden implement all of them. So what I'd really like, what we'd really like, is to take one or two of them and take some steps to implement them in your life. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about a specific one. And just take the time uh, to grow in that discipline uh, so that you can deepen your relationship uh, with your creator and to re- deepen your relationship with his creation. Thank you guys. We love you and we'll see you later.